of course we will also uh, include uh, Marvin will also including the design resilience insight from strategic planning, master planning, urban design, and architecture. So, Marvin, the floor is yours. Okay, and terima kasih, Widi. Oh, kembali. Um, <laughs> um, yes, um, selamat tengah hari. Um, good afternoon. Um, um, yeah, as what has been mentioned by Widi, um, I'll be um, sharing those uh, slides. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, so this is the part two. So this, this is what we have covered in the, the other day, items one to four, and the two items below are the ones we're gonna to cover today. In addition, uh, we're gonna cover this one. I have uh, rearranged the order of the items that I'll be um, um, sharing. So just a brief um, talk about the resources of the region. Then item two, um, what I'll be showing is a vernacular architecture. And from there, I'll be talking about its materiality. And then number three, a brief talk about what, how do we usually do design? How do we usually um, um, build? Number four, uh, sorry, on item three, it's very, very brief. Um, that is, I'm just going to focus on what is in the Philippines that is probably not um, practiced in the region. Item four, um, brief intro on the applicable national building regulation. I'm just going to give you the overview of what are they. Number five, just insights. Uh, excuse me, do you share yes. the share, uh, do you share the screen because we only can see you and not your oh. slide. Sorry, I, I don't hear. No problem. Shares. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just. Um, by the way, the reason why I took this photo as the first one, <clears throat> because uh, for Filipinos, this is the image of Bayanihan. Um, um, I talk about Bayanihan in the previous talk about the. Um, like a collective um, identity, collective brotherhood. Um, it is an image of how Filipinos are resilient um, hundreds of years ago. So basically, if a place is deemed risky, um, they could relocate towns, they could relocate their dwellings. And this is a traditional Filipino house, which is the Bahay Kubo. And in the Bahay Kubo, what you would see is um, the walls and the roofs are made of nipa leaves, dried nipa leaves, and they are on stilts. Uh, that is, um, I will explain later why they are on stilts. And what happens is if a place is deemed risky, then the whole community will gather around to help that family move its house. So that, that is for me an image of resilience. So this is items one to four are what we have covered the other day. This is what we're gonna to cover today in, I, I rejig the order. So um, first off with resources. So Naga and the, wide, and the wider uh, Bicol region, <clears throat> um, Naga and the wider Bicol region uh, economy comprised mainly of farming and with the following produce. Um, coconuts, abaca, banana, coffee. And in, it's interesting to note that the poverty incidence of Bicol traditionally has been high. I think I mentioned previously that Bicol used to be a poor province. As, you, as what you can see 20 years ago, it's more than half of the population lives below the country's uh, poverty line bearing in fact that our poverty line could already be lower than another country. And yet in Bicol region, 20 years ago, it's more than half. Uh, but how they have significantly lowered that 
in the span of, of two decades. Now, these are the traditional products. So it's still agricultural by and large. What I would just like to, <clears throat> to highlight is the um, abaca or hemp. So this is made from um, either the abaca plant or the or banana, banana husk. They would um, draw the, the, the fabric out of it. And then from there, traditionally, it has given birth to um, rope making or paper making. And those, um, those, these are the products that characterize the area. These are the mainstay or the uh, permanent uh, means it, it, it's being cultivated um, all year round. Um, seasonal would be corn and rice. <clears throat> um, on vernacular, so vernacular architecture, uh, vernacular architecture and building materials in the Philippines are influenced by climate, uh, local, and global technology. Um, there's something wrong with the font, some texts are missing. So um, I will start off with the um, timeless vernacular. So these are, I would say, the original type of architecture way before um, the Spaniards arrived. And what you would see is that would have a lot of, of similarities probably with Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and the region, maybe even Thailand. Um, in the north, the, uh, the northernmost province, the, um, the people there are called the Ibatan. And these are the area that's closest to Taiwan. <clears throat> this area receives um, usually the strongest typhoons uh, regularly. And so um, how the local people there uh, have built is that they have used um, um, stones quarried from the, from the sea and mix it with lime and mortar. And then again, with, with the um, nipa, uh, or, Nipa leaves for their roof. Now in the mountain ranges um, in Luzon, um, this is the um, traditional house, the Ifugao house. Um, what you will see here is um, these tribal people um, hundreds of years ago, they developed this architecture where in the main living space is raised from the ground. And that is to protect it from from wild animals and also to allow um, strong winds to pass through and also surface runoff to, to pass through. So it, 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 it doesn't cut off wind, it doesn't cut off uh, water and it's raised. <clears throat> now this um, ladder that you see here, so when the family come go in in the evening and sleep, they would remove this ladder. So thereby protecting it from wild animals from coming up. Now, in terms of crawling um, um, like rats or, or other things like that, they have, a, they have this uh, like a stone around it. So it kind of prevents um, uh, rodents from coming up to the main floor. And what you see here is actually two level. So this is what you see. And these are the local terminologies of it. So they have the main living area and, and uh, a sleeping uh, level here. And that uh, um, strong slope, again, allows for water to drain so easily. So imagine if this is along the slope of a mountain, it, the, the aerodynamic of the house um, blends well with the natural surrounding. <clears throat> now in the lowlands, and I would say this is more of the Visayan and Tagalog house. So they kind of retain some elements by having still the house raised. So it st still is raised from the ground. So again, I would say that's very tropical because during, um, so during hot, hot months, when the ground is, is generating heat, you have this um, void where in, the heat get dissipated by flowing airflow before it reaches the house. So it makes the house cooler. So nowadays we just build concrete slab on, on top of the earth and that absorbs all the heat. In terms of when, if there would be um, slight flooding, so that still won't be affected. 
if there are um, snakes or things like that, it's it it offers more protection. And in terms of materials, it's still um, locally available. You have the the nipa nipa leaves and um, bamboo. <coughs> Albeit that Philippine hardwood is also uh, very much um, available. So um, this is what I would say the, the most uh, prevalent in terms of, of, of um, traditional houses for the, for the uh, people of Filipinos um, back you know, hundreds of years ago. And many of these terminologies are still being used. So when I say bintana, bintana is window. Sahig is floor. Now, notice the term soleras is Spanish sounding. It's a Spanish term for uh, joys. Um, pera medallion. Um, this is part of the traditional um, building construction where in um, during the um, putting of the posts, you would put um, ma money or coins to provide um, prosperity. Agdanan is stairs, Babaan is going down, so, so on and so forth. So Haligi is post, Ding Ding is, is um, wall. And from, from this more um, ubiquitous, you would see this, which is a fancy um, cottage. So some tourist areas, they will still retain this design uh, but still um, incorporating that element, it's still raised from the ground, so it makes it cooler. Now, even the materiality, even though it's woven and gives you a sense of privacy, it is still breathable. <coughs> but obviously, with regards to um, um, strength and durability, it's not very much permanent. You, you could probably say maximum lifespan of about 30, 40 years. So hence the Bahay Kubo. So, so um, up until the 1960s, uh, Filipinos house, the middle, middle and lower class would be living in this type of, 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 uh, of dwelling in the countryside. Again, at any point, if you would like to question, just, just um, um, raise them so we could discuss them along with what we're seeing on the slide. <clears throat> now, Towards the south or Mindanao, um, this would have more uh, Muslim influence in it. Uh, this is what you will see. Uh, uh, this is uh, what we call the Torogan. Now, Torogan is uh, more well known with the Maranao uh, Muslim, and it could probably have a lot of, of similarities with Malaysian and Indonesian architecture with regards to the planning, the location of the pose the roof design, and most especially in terms of ornamentation, wherein you would find uh, panolong. And that's the uh, drawing. So where, how similar it is or how different it is, you could also let me know. This is what I know from, from my country, but obviously it would have similarities in iteration with, with Indonesia. Now, in terms of the interior of the house, um, it, it, it's very varied from, from um, ordinary to more fancy, but what you see are typical, are retaining the look and feel. So the look and feel is you would have this very airy, um, you could probably say loft space, wherein um, hot air rises up and it gets blown away. It's, it's, it's house that is very much breathable. So even the walls, uh, wind could pass through. And if rain touches them, they would just glide down. And the floor are made of a bamboo spars, basically a bamboo that has been cut and laid um, horizontally. So any water that you spill, even from inside the house, it would just drain because the house is raised from the ground. And <clears throat> And this is a more uh, fancy iteration of it. And um, still the, the usage of same bamboo materials for furniture, the same nipa leaves even for, um, uh, it's not even for rug, which we call um, banig. So this woven rug, we call them banig. And even the patterns 
Um, I, I suppose that would have similarities with Indonesia as well. And to even fanciful resort, so still retaining that, that design, that, that um, airy loft space there, the use of, of uh, uh, um, traditional materials, even for um, um, fancy furnitures, is what you can see here. And still allowing the house to be breathable and open as much as possible. So, so that is against the, the, the wind, the, against the hot summer months, against rain, so the overhang, the overhang of the house is very much longer. So even if it rains almost 45 degree, the, the rains will not um, come in. Maybe mist would, would come. And even typical restaurants. So again, if you, if you look at the image, even the colors, even from the most ordinary to to fancy resorts or restaurants, it has that similar look and feel, a very airy loft. And that gives us a sense of grandness. It's, if, you, if, if I would say compared to UK dwelling, it's, it's big outside, but all the rooms are very small because it's very cold. So you want to retain your, the heat generated by body. In Southeast Asia, it's always very much expansive. And that's how we project our grandness. <clears throat> and even playing with our local building materials to achieve that purpose. And even the, the light, dependent lightings are made from traditional materials. So even with all these images, if you translate it to modern, to modern contemporary structure like an airport, this is our airport in Cebu, it still has the same feeling. So when you come in as an ordinary Filipino who doesn't live in a fancy uh, modernist house, this series of slides from, from a very ordinary house, even going to an airport, still has the same look and feel. Yeah. And, and coming from the Igorot house, the one that I mentioned on still, it has that same feeling. You're looking at the, at the soffit of your roof. So that is the image, I think, of a vernacular, so that's why I call it timeless because this is what, what I think uh, Filipino at the barest soul is, which would be very much similar to its Southeast Asian uh, neighbors. Now, when the foreigners come, when the Spaniards arrive, then the Americans, they brought in their influences. So, and this is how um, I would coin it a celebrated colonial because um, in, you know, when we talk about nostalgia as Filipinos, or if we talk about being fancy, being rich, being wealthy, we always allude to this type of architecture. Um, and maybe this is a strong remnant of colonial mentality where Ian, if you as a Filipino uh, family, you would want to even boast or brag to your friends that I, I come from an illustrious rich family. You always prove it by drawing roots to a colonial um, clan, by saying that during the Spanish era, my family uh, is a land owning um, hacendero or a farm owning uh, family. <clears throat> and whether this is rightly or wrongly is remains to be interpreted, but it is something that has defined even the, the current um, sense of, of identity of the Filipinos. So you would still have the class that, that has not lived in this kind of house, which I would say um, the majority of the Filipinos. And then you would have the elite class that was able to enjoy this kind of, of living. So there's that disconnect uh, uh, that you would see. Now, why I chose this is because um, it is it it has that um, foreign influence in it, and yet the way it was designed and built has a lot of local uh, vernacular materials. The translucent materials that you see here are made out of capis or seashells, and that gives us that local flavor. 
Now, what you see here, this is, if I show you, if I show you this photo and, and I show you this picture, and I show you this picture and this picture, they, they, they have a feeling of, of probably having from a grandfather to a grandson. This picture is, is, a, is a typical photo of, of Madrid, the capital of Spain. And notice that it has regular street patterns, could have some diagonals, and the use of Baroque um, architecture as, as, as a sense of wealth, a sense of higher um, ornaments, higher level of architecture. And how that has been carried to its first level province, which is uh, Mexico. This is just a typical town in Quito. So it still has those elements in it. And, and it, they were able to achieve um, multi-story, uh, but they are more plain. Now, this is in Vigan in the Philippines. Um, still has that um, flavor, and again, albeit, uh, less ornamented, uh, but but that tells you the relationship of of the Philippines to its mother country during the Spanish era, Spain, and why I inserted Mexico because for hundreds of years um, Philippines was ruled by Spain, not they not even directly. So probably if you think of Indonesia, imagine if you were not ruled by Netherlands directly, but probably from let's say South Africa. And that is how we were. So Philippines was ruled by Spain through Mexico. And, and that has always been for 200 years uh, up until the last probably 75 years of Spanish rule that we were ruled directly. And that is only because um, Mexico gained their independence. But that, that historical event has a lot of influence to how the architecture has been molded. Now, uh, while this you could say is the um, Spanish colonial model. This is not what you would typically find in the Philippines. You would probably find this in maybe one, two or three places. Now, many um, older um, communities in the Philippines would, would have this look rather. Now, this is in Intramuros in Manila, so vegan, and Intramuros, so they're very much um, Hispanic. And it tells you again of the wealth of those cities by, by, by this um, colonial architecture. But what you would see as a striking difference between this and this one is that, oh, on this level, you would notice that the upper floor is made out of wood and it has that overhang. We call it the volada. Now this volada, you would not see this in in, in, Mex in Mexico, nor in Spain. So this is, um, I would say an innovation or an adaptation rather to the, to the Philippine local context. Why? Because we talk about Philippines being an earthquake prone country. Now, it, traditionally, if you would build this as all stone to the third floor, when earthquakes happen, they would crumble because of the weight because, because they are not designed to, to shake laterally. Now in response, architecture changed by having upper floors lighter, so they, they don't impose much weight. And the, the, the structural support for this floor is not even carried by these walls. You would now have um, wooden um, pillars um, at the secondary level, I mean, on, uh, behind rather, behind these walls that support the floor joists of this level. So what, what that happens is, imagine if this is the lower level and with the walls made up of, of stones or adobe, then this is the level that is made up of, of wood. Now when earthquake happens, these two would shake independently. So the risk of this wall getting, with these walls getting so stressed and crumbling down gets lesser because they don't essentially carry the weight of this level. This level is supported by interior posts, which is also made of wood. So they shake independently. 
and that's and that's the adaptation to it. So notice this kind of design is also replicated by other houses there. And uh, this is, I would say, a wealthy um, Filipino house. And looking at the design of this, this is probably built in the early 20th century. This is already when uh, we already have a change of colonial masters from Spain to America. So, but you would still see remnants of, of design from the Spanish era and then the advent of probably uh, Beau Arts or Art Nouveau in, in, in the ornamentation of this design or even neoclassical by, by those column capitals. But you would still see elements of the uh, balcony and the uh, volada in this design. And notice that the brick wall for this uh, building is only on the ground floor. So even if this house experienced the strongest earthquake, maybe intensity seven or eight, even if this brick wall did crack and crumble, the house would still be there. Now we talk about the house being breathable, in terms that you can open. And you would see here, these are what we call the ventanilla and the, the bintana. So the, the, the house, the facade of the house is operable. You can always open it as much as you can and close it. Now, when you, you experience strong rain and yet the temperature is very hot and I, I suppose you could understand this. I suppose if I'm talking to British audience, I could never make them understand a, a condition where it's raining very hard and yet the temperature is very hot. But obviously for us in Southeast Asia, we know that feeling and it's very hot, it's, ra it's raining hard and humidity is very high. You are inside your house feeling sweaty and sticky. So how this house uh, responded to that is the windows can be closed so the air will not go in and yet the ventanilla could still remain open. So the cool breezy air could still go in. And that to us is, is a sustainable design that has been designed hundreds of years ago. But if you look at a, a typical building now, you don't see these elements now. So earlier when, I, when you asked me, how is the, the state of vernacular architecture to contemporary architecture, I would say our identity is lost because we, we don't build this way anymore. And, and again, these are the common examples that you would see of a colonial house. So again, the usage of that thick adobe st um, stone uh, walls and a light and airy breezy first floor. Now this first floor is the main floor of the house. This is where all the occupants live. The ground level would be what we call for the carwaje or the carriages and also the bodega or the store storage. So typically the, uh, families who get to, to live in this house are the hacienderos or the land owning families. So they would naturally store their valuable produce with, within their um, storage area and their carriageways, coachways. And even the entrances, they would usually have a side entrance going up rather than the, from the front. So it has that sense of grand arrival. Now, uh, in terms of, of uh, materiality, the, the way we design our, we use our brick is similar to probably Mediterranean. So again, that Spanish influence. So you would see several examples, but the look and feel are the same. And this is the inside. So you would see this is the ventanilla. This is a closed ventanilla, and this is an open ventanilla. So it allows again the air to breathe in and out. The windows, the, the ventana, you have the first layer over here, which wherein you would have your capis inlay. So that is when you shut it, it blocks off the air, but still the sunlight gets permeated in. So you have the translucent facade. So imagine that, that technology then, you know, you have a translucent facade and, and now you have to use very expensive materials to achieve that. And yet 
um, when when it gets very very bright, you know, when the sun is shining directly inside your house, and it's very hot. Now you don't want to close the first layer because when you close it, the sun would still come in and the wind will not come in, which is exactly opposite of what you want to happen. You want the wind to come in, but not the sun. So what you close is the louvers or the shutters, which I think has a lot of similarity in Indonesian architecture. And then on the third layer, you would have here, which is uh, the calados, which is again, it varies from house to house, but it allows the hot air to come out. So basic principle of, 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 of uh, uh, sustainability design, you have cooler air coming in, getting hot and then coming out. And why we, I said that this is celebrated colonial is because inside this picture, you would see that they are trying their best to replicate how a wealthy um, house in Europe or in America looks like in, at the turn of the century by having these metal um, ceiling panels and carvings. And even the photo, whether this is uh, neoclassical um, paintings, but still infused with local materials such as this one. And even our, our hat is made up of, of nipa. And even during this time, just for as a side fact, some, some hats would have metal on top and some of these metals have intricate, intricate um, designs. And that is to indicate the, the, you know, the master, the hacendero. So when he goes to, the, to his farm and he could be growing rice or, or sugar with, with the plantation, maybe even higher or maybe his head level, this metal piece would attract the sun, you know, the sunlight, it would glisten. So that is a signal to his um, farmers, to his laborers that the master is on the side. So you better get your act together because the master is around. So that is just in practice. Um, some, some photos that, um, some items you would see, you would see this sumka, which is, I think you would see, you would have in Indonesia. I think you, you also play songka. And then look at these um, potted plants on that, that uh, short pedestal. That gives you the Chinese influence. So you have the Chinese, you have the Southeast Asian, you have the European, and then Filipino, if you mix them together. Now, with regards to um, master planning, um, Sorry, I have not talked about uh, the Spanish uh, planning law, which is the Leyes de las Indias, but I think I briefly discussed that in the, the first lecture. Now, what I would um, discuss here is the City Beautiful Movement. Now, this uh, planning that you see is not in the Philippines. This is the plan for the city of Chicago, US, by Daniel Burnham. And how you would notice is the orientation against the body of uh, towards the body of water that grand uh, public government space grand boulevard and then from the landmarks you get dissecting roads and boulevards avenues and then over a regular pattern street now this planning has been uh, romanticized by the same designer daniel burnham in manila now, this is Manila Bay on the south. Um, for orientation, the north is pointing to the left. The south is on the right. So this is the west, this is the east. So how it's been designed is that this is the river and this is the um, Intramuros, which is the colonial city. Where he built is the, um, ex the moat of the uh, walled city. And he, he used the same design, that grandness of public space. And he envisioned that whenever the sun sets, it would give that dramatic view to the government center. And then you, have, you would have the regular street and diagonal radiating, uh, sorry, diagonal boulevards with uh, rotundas. And this has not been completed. This has not been affected 100%, at best maybe 50%. 
And this is what we have that you will see uh, now. This is our national mall, if you're talking from an American perspective, which we call Luneta. So that is that uh, boulevard that is facing um, um, uh, Manila Bay. Now, why am I showing this is because from, a co from our collective sense of, of whenever people say uh, master planning or urban design, people still romanticize this design by saying, oh, that is the grand plan, that's the beautiful plan. But whether this is still relevant 100 years from ago to now remains to be um, um, discussed uh, and studied. And I would sum this, uh, um, this section with this picture. This is the picture of the Philippine Post Office building. And during the American time, postal services like our internet now, so that's the, the nerve center for commerce and trade. And notice the heavy use of neoclassical design. Now this, this building, interestingly, uh, was designed by a Filipino architect who was educated uh, in America during the American time. And what you would notice in his career is that when he designed this, he followed the American textbook. He was told, bring America, bring that sense of power from America to the Philippines because we are now your masters. And yet, towards his latter career, he said, maybe I should design with more Filipinos in mind because Albeit that this is grand, this is beautiful, it's, it projects the power of the state, of the government, sense of order. But nowhere in this building you would see, see the Philippine ornaments. There's, so if you're a, a poor or, or the majority Filipino class then, you will never identify yourself with this building. To you, it's like alien spaceship landing onto your land. So, his, so when he was commissioned to design, a theater. So he, he thought, okay, I'm going to design it in terms of planning, learning the, the models that I learned from the West. But then the ornaments, I'm going to infuse it with many Filipino items. So if, if you would have an interest to study this building in detail, you would see the patterns are very mixed. It's like a hodgepodge of Filipino ornaments. You would see patterns from the Igorot tribe. You, you, there, there are even statues of, of a naked Igorota, Igorot woman in her traditional garb. And, and even the colors. Now, you, one could argue that the design of this building is um, bow arts. And yet the way it was designed is very much Filipino in terms of ornaments. And even the ceiling panels of the theater, you would not see um, acanthus leaves in Europe, but what you would see, you would see banana leaf, banana leaves, bananas, mangoes. So that's his way of, 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 of uh, ornaments. And that to him would, would say to a typical Filipino, probably a farmer who gets to sit here saying, oh yes, I get to identify myself in this building. Now, this building was designed in the 19, mid, mid 1930s. So that is still within the um, American um, reg, um, colonial time. <clears throat> in the 1960s, and this is the time when the Philippines is already an independent country. And we are trying to showcase our identity to the world. So during the colonial time, we are trying to showcase who we are in our colonial masters. Either we exhibited ourselves in Spain or we exhibited ourselves in US. But this is when we say to the world, to everyone that, hey, we are our own people, our own identity, and this is who we are. And there, this Filipino architect, uh, Leandro Loxin, designed this uh, pavilion in 19, I think 1967 or 1970s in Osaka. And he took inspiration from a Filipino uh, fisher boat, uh, a vinta. And he took that, that sail and make it modern. And to him, it has a lot of meaning. It, it, it showcases the people that we are a country on the rise, becoming a prosperous country. 
We are no longer a colony. We get to chart our own destiny and we get to be modern. And yet, even, well, even uh, if we strive towards modernity, you would still have that sense of airiness that you would see in, in even the most basic houses. And what is not shown is in this photo is, I don't know whether you can see my, my mouse pointer over there, which is at the ridge of this uh, sloping roof. You have an array of, of skylights and the way it's designed, it has the same um, capis, uh, capis um, uh, roof lights. You know, when I was showing to you that, that first layer of window, wherein you would have the, the seashells, it's using that material. And again, that is telling the visitors that this is a modern house, contemporary, but yet the materiality is Filipino. And then later on in his career, he's, he tried to be uh, brutalist and orient and reinterpret our traditional architecture in a more um, uh, mysterious way, maybe. So he, he thinks that our usual um, dwellings, they're always raised from the ground on stilts, and that is where you have the main floor. So in, in 1965, when he was asked to design the National Theater for the country, he said, I'm not going to design it with ornaments that you could identify the Americans or the Spanish with. I'm going to make it plain. And yet the form, the, the, the logic behind it could still be Filipinos. So whether that is true or not remains to be seen. But at that time, he, he designed this with a lot of maybe mystery in it. It's basically just a floating slab and there's a lot of meaning that you can draw from it. And then from that design, he replicated it with the um, International Convention Center. So he's saying that we, we are a nation of archipelago, we are islands floating on water. So maybe I would like to see floating land, land masses on water. So he imagined this as you know, water, water, and then you have those floating slabs. But then, uh, which, is, which is quite a flip, he designed this um, um, performance uh, venue in University of the Philippines in Laguna campus. And he tried to, to take inspiration from the Igorot house, the one I showed you the first one, on how that building, uh, the roof of that house blends with the mountainous topography. And he tried to take that inspiration from there to here. And, and still retaining the very airy and breezy character for the air to flow in. And then another architect, uh, Francisco Manosa, designed this building and he, he was arguing that, well, um, we, we are also known for our rice terraces, which I think Indonesia or even Thailand also have, but Philippines has a greater claim that it's been built thousands of years ago and it's in UNESCO heritage site. And he say, hey, that, that um, mixing of dwelling and agriculture uh, in being interpreted or being applied in a mountainous topography, whether I would use that inspiration and design a corporate office this is the corporate headquarters of San Miguel Corporation, which is the biggest private corporation in the Philippines. And how he tried to mimic that design and maybe whether this is sustainable or not, the, the floors of each building are staggered and, and um, smaller from one floor against the, the one uh, below. And so it, it creates that like a pyramid effect so it has that step terraces. And how the, the glazed windows were designed is that, is that instead of being vertical, he made it projecting diagonally towards outside. So when you say that when he did this facade window like this, he's arguing that if your window is vertical and the sun is here, the heat of the sun touches your windows and gets dissipated internally. But if you make it like this one, when the sun is here, shines here, it doesn't shine directly inside the building. So the heat doesn't get transferred. And yet the light, the one that you want, gets um, translucent to be inside. And what you will see when you're inside the house, 
you look at the window, what you will see are the plants. So it has that refreshing feel. So whether that's the right approach, this has been this, this was designed in the 1980s or not, 40 years ago. Now we are a nation of shopping malls. Our shopping malls are typically big box. I don't think I need to elaborate on that. It's just a big box that consumes everywhere. And one of the world's biggest, uh, biggest conglomerate builders of shopping mall is a Filipino company. Now, this is a shopping mall that was built and designed in 2004. And it tried to break the big box mentality by basically flipping the program inside out. So it follows that terrace feeling because the designer thinks that, well, Filipinos, we, uh, you know, we go to shopping mall as a way of, way of life, not really to buy things. To, uh, that is a place to meet people, to celebrate whatever it, it is. So he, he flipped that design and make it like this one. So it's a terrace design and it has that, that feeling towards plazas, which you would have the Spanish to thank for the, the loss of the Indies. And uh, from this design to a, a, a back to traditional design, wherein this is a high street, uh, whether this design is more European in, in origin, wherein uh, you would have a strip mall and instead of investing in controlled environment, make it open, make it pet friendly, people could go there and do many programs, remains to be done. Now, traditional beliefs, practices in designing and construction. Now, this is basic. Um, in, in all the buildings for wealthy and poor, we always design our stairs just like this. So basically, what the terms oro, plata, and mata means is that you have gold, silver, and debt. Mata is debt, but it's also meaning eyes for Filipinos. Mata. So you would never design your stairs to line to, to end in Mata because that would mean that the users or the inhabitants of that building would incur accidents or deaths. Mm -hmm. So you would usually say that, oh, I'm going to design you four stairs, four steps. So it would end in Oro. So that would, you would be more prosperous. We have what we call the uh, Padugo. So padugo is when you're pouring concrete for the concrete foundation, you, you spill blood from animals, usually chicken, but it could be other animals as well. Now, this mm -hmm. is a belief that is um, practiced all the way from the mountainous people, the um, Igorot, or the Ifugo traditional people. So they, they believe that the soul of the animal will get will live in that in your house and will help protect you, the house and, the, and other inhabitants from bad luck. And then we have the, uh, the medallion. You know, when we, I discussed this before, where in, in the post you would throw coins, that is for prosperity. Um, but most common would be being a, a Christian nation, every structure gets blessed by a priest. This is more on the commissioning side. In the um, national codes, um, you could go to this website and from there you will see all the applicable codes in the Philippines. So the first one will talk about um, disabled access, so accessibility law. Um, I'm just gonna highlight the ones that are uh, the most important. So you have BP344, then you have the National Building Code, uh, Green Building Code. Although the Green Building Code is not as, it doesn't carry much tooth, not like the, the one in Singapore. So this is the National Building Code. Um, Albeit that this was the, uh, promulgated in, I think, 1976, there was uh, quite new um, implementing rules, IRR. There should be a new IRR for the uh, 
uh, building code where Ian, they didn't change the law, but they just reinterpreted it with, with guidelines. This is the fire code, which is Republic Act 9514. Uh, this is the newest version. And then on environmental, um, when, when you would do developments, large scale developments, especially on Greenfield side, you would be asked to produce environmental clearance a compliance certificate, more, most importantly. So you could just go to this website. Now, um, resilient design and policies insight. What I would just show here are just random thoughts, probably some from other project examples. Mm -hmm. So number one is in other countries, they practice this geo-environmental um, hazard assessment or or soil investigation before any development. And this is something that is not very much practiced in our in, in Philippines. So it's important to understand the, the land, the site that they're building on by studying the, the soil condition, whether there are services or probably whether it was a, uh, an old landfill site and things like that. So because that could affect the health and well being of the inhabit inhabitants, even the structural design. Uh, flood risk. Um, this is a local flood risk map in the place where I live. You know, this is my house near the river. Now, what you will see here is that here in the UK, they have developed because we are we are a country that I mean, UK is a country that receives much rainfall as well, and yet they have crafted their their you know, their usable land by, by demarcating which are the flood prone areas and which are not. So you don't need to even build flood defenses, but just restricting developments there and just saying that, oh, when it rains, it floods and all the flooding area will happen on this. So basically don't build there, you know, don't build in this area. So you would notice why some of the developments are like patches, they're not continuous. And they provide that green belt break between communities. And it's a natural floodplain. And these are um, other um, storm water management. Um, you could compare the different strategies from gutter flow, um, whether you could retain surface runoff on a more localized uh, manner, fire retention, instead of irrigating the, the, the plants, or a bioretention basin or with a planter or constructed wetland. So these are what I would say a sustainable, um, sustainable drainage solutions or SUGS. So this is a housing development here in the UK where Ian, they, they would just leave this space in the middle and that is a natural wetland. I'm not sure what in, this is, in the Philippines, this is heavily practiced. I'm not sure in Indonesia either, but does it affect land utilization? Well, you can say yes, but then you you would say you would think that albeit that you you lose that opportunity to develop this land if you're going to build on this land, and then you would have to fight flooding forever. Which one would you choose? You know, have you really maximized your whole country? You know, what what usually ends up is you have a big space that is 100% developed, 100% concreted, and a, a big space that is virgin forest. Now, during extreme rain, all the rains from here flows into the urbanized area and there's the water that has nowhere to go. But if you were to have this, it would minimize, you know, instead of, because the Philippines or maybe Indonesia, we, we have this thinking that, oh, we are an archipelago. If it rains the hardest, it would just drain off to the sea. But you have to remember, Naga City is in a basin. It's not coastal and it's surrounded by, by mountains. So when you investigate that, please investigate, do they have this system? Have they thought about this? Now, they are lucky that the city size is still small, but would you allow the city to just organically grow like a cancer? Or would you provide a green belt, but still offer new developments, satellite developments? Um, 
in this uh, project that uh, I had before, uh, what we had here is a, this project, by the way, is an industrial industrial park. And for, you know, for designing industrial park, client would say, I want it hundred percent, make it hundred percent usable, but you have to design with the elements. So very basic solution, where's the prevailing wind pattern orient your building so you don't have to fight with them. Um, minimize direct east-west sun principle so because that is the hottest so you put your corners facing them um, thermal comfort um, these are very basic pedestrian shading then reduce pr providing drainage for surface runoff by making things permeable where possible uh, rain, rain water, gray water harvesting. I think this has been uh, quite um, common. Uh, in the UK, we have this system called the Kobe, where in, in one system, um, the design, the building, and the operation of a building is seamless. You have a system that, that, that mar marries them. So what this system basically tells you is that if you are using Revit as an example, Revit uh, as a design software, you could put components there that would already mean how it's going to be built and how are you going to maintain it. So when you put, let's say, a wall system, that wall would have those properties in them. So when you design it, maybe you're just growing floor plans, but that, that wall in that floor plan has that information in them. That's when you trust transmit that document to the contractor, he would receive that traditional floor plan, but at a click of a button, you could say, what are the building uh, methodology of all this wall system? And the, that, that software would extract all of them to documents and tell the contractor. And then from there, from that same uh, file, you could at a click of a button say, for example, all the lighting fixtures that you're gonna say, put in there, maybe, that lighting fixture would say, this would have a, a lifespan of how many years? So when you transmit that same model or that same file to the operators, they could get alarms by saying, the, the light bulb in this room, in that floor, in that building will burn out by this time, maybe in 10 years time or in five years time. And maybe three months before that, the operator would get notified by saying, hey, I need to buy a new bulb. But do you have to manually inspect all this bulb? But you would know the lifespan of each component. And, and that is the system behind this design. Now, um, this, is, um, this is a system where in, they are integrating smart sensors in construction. Uh, this is gathered from a project that a company built uh, a military airbase in the Middle East, where in it is a very adverse site, you know, with matters of security, with matters of a very expansive site, with matters of high temperature, that monitoring the curing time for concrete is very difficult. So you pour the formworks, you pour the formworks would say whether they are rightly placed and the, the, those sensors will feed into the system. You put in your concrete and then the sensor would feed into the system whether yes, the concrete has cured sufficiently, you could add onto it instead of, of, of employing dozens hundreds of people to check your construction, it gets sense to the system and there's that AI in them. And lastly, I will add um, my talk to this um, diagram. It's not done by me, but it is an integration of, of, a, of a smart system. Uh, maybe five, 10 years ago, when we talk about smart buildings, smart designs, not many people would have a firmer understanding, but maybe because now you have Facebook or you have um, Alexa, you have Google, you know, you, you would 
you would know that you know when you say Alexa, you know like Hey Google or or Hey Siri, lights lights would open up, you know, music would play, and this is part of that. In in the hospital that I was, sorry, seeing my Siri stop. <laughs> So in a hospital that I was designing with uh, in Singapore, they were integrating patient locator bands. And what that bands tell the nurses is where that patient is going. And that band, you know, like if a patient slip and fall, that band would alarm the nurse. So even if you as a patient inside the toilet would slip and fall, obviously the toilet is closed. No one would know that you have, you have, you have slip already. The nurses would get alarmed that hey, this patient has sleep and fall, and it has many um, integration of robotics in it. So, um, what I'm saying in this slide in this slide is the uh, building management system. You know how how you can remotely control um, building elements with regards to uh, weather condition, whether you can have an auto remotely operated. Uh, Move, movable uh, facade that you could open and close. You know, when I was discussing about the vernacular architecture or things like that. So just points for thoughts. Um, these are the things that I could probably leave that you could think when you when you design. So first is let's try to be pragmatic in our solutions. Let's try to, to make our design um, appetizing to the people who would buy it. You know, architects, we often think very romantic, but sometimes when you talk to clients, they will not grasp what you want to say. If you're talking to politicians, they will think, yes, 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 but that solution exists in the in an architect's world. It will not exist in a political situation. So let's try to have that um, understanding. Now to offer new growth strategies, although we talk about conservation of design and things like that, it's all about offering new development potential. So Naga City is a small city, two kilometer radius. Would you allow that two kilometer to be 10 kilometers, 20 kilometer radius like Metro Manila? Or would you say, what is the right radius for you to say that stop, don't grow anymore, but create a satellite? What is that maximum radius? that would orient the quality of life and even affect the marketability of that land. So while, while you could have a green belt, how will you, how will you improve the, the inner areas? So that is infield development. Then how do you weave the vernacular identity when I talk about the different architectural styles and historical evolution to what is the current social cultural aspirations of the people? You know, like, let's say if you talk about Igorot House and you're, you're talking to a 20 year old Filipino, you say, would you want to live in a Igorot House? Then you know, obviously not. But how do you integrate that identity and, and offer it to a younger generation? And then that would still be appetizing and still mix the architectural technology. Now we talk about cities being a prime um, contributor of carbon. And then we talk about cities reducing carbon footprint, but how can you even offer carbon sink? So what is a carbon sink? For example, here in the UK, they have what they call a moss, moss area. It's just basically a swamp. But what, why are they retaining that? Because they're saying it's carbon sink. The moss absorbs carbon from the environment. So even though this community generates carbon, this um, absorbs more, so effectively they are carbon negative, not even carbon neutral. Now, we, it's always a challenge that older generation has a, even me, I'm almost 40, uh, there are some technologies that I'm already saying, oh, I don't wanna get into that. You know, Like I don't even do Instagram or, or, or Twitter or TikTok. I'm okay with Facebook. So that's me maybe refusing to learn new technology. But instead of learning technology, why, you know, let's try to, to think of technology and architecture as a way to learn from the users. So when, we, when I've been uh, involved in many hospital designs, 
you cannot change how a patient will will act or will will heal or a, a clinicians will do their works, but you could change how your building responds to these users. So that is technology learning from the users. You know, you, you don't tell a patient that hey, if you fall, if you sleep in the bathroom, can you press your bracelet so the nurse will get alarmed? No, that that's learning from technology. Instead, you tell the bracelet to learn from the user that if that patient falls, the nurse gets notified. So that's technology learning from the user. In the UK, they are quite strict with landscape view impacts. So basically, and this is this could be helpful in your project. You have you have Mount Isarog, a prominent mountain near Naga. And maybe you could say, hey, that is a prime view. Let's protect that. Because if you build this with all, let's say six story building, if I'm walking on the street, I would not know my orientation. But you will not restrict development by saying, hey, everyone would just, should just be a bungalow. So what you would do is you celebrate a frame view. You offer constriction and delight. Maybe as you're walking along the street, you will not see the mountain. You will appreciate the built environment. And then you, you arrive at the plaza, and then from there, you will see the mountain. And then it gets repeated. And that is how you experience the city. You experience the local flavor, that's constriction. You go to a plaza, and then from the plaza, you think, hey, where am I? Then you look at the mountain. Oh, I'm probably at this area of the city. And that is without even using GPS. Then from pedestrian crossing to wildlife bridges. It is interesting, even here in the UK, when I was doing a master plan for an industrial park, again, industrial park, but then the planner asked me, you have to provide habitat linkways in your estate. And imagine every space matters and yet you have to allow for three meters just for natural wildlife to cross. And that is resilience because you don't want to spend money putting them in a conservation camp or putting them in a zoo. You want them in their natural environment, but you also want to coexist with them. Yeah, so you, you have to think, it's not just man crossing the road, also wildlife. And this is um, relevant today from COVID shielding to new norm planning. You know, uh, before COVID, we always talk about cities as, as intense, compact places with high number of occupants. When lockdown happens, everybody wants to escape the city. Those who live in the countryside get to have a better um, lifestyle than those who live in the city. And that is new norm planning. Um, you have to think about that. How can you make the, you know, when, when, when lockdown happens and all the shopping malls were closed, what form of exercise, what form of entertainment can you avail of? It's just your neighborhood part. If you build your community, everything develop with a shopping mall to feed the recreational needs. Is that sustainable under the new norm planning or would you have pocket parks that could also act as a uh, sustainable urban uh, drainage solution? And this is what I'm saying from enclosed leisure retail centers to outdoor recreational expanse. And take note of the word expanse, and that is a luxury. And then this is the last. It's, it's not only, you know, Filipinos, we always say, oh, we are like a bamboo. We, you know, we always say this. We are like a bamboo when storm, when all the calamity comes, or even political calamity comes, we are like a bamboo, you just bend but you will not break. But that is a good mentality, but why can't you adapt something better? Yeah, you bend, you, know, you did not get broken, but it's all about how do you build back better? You know, when, when we discuss about late, did they change how they build back? So that's the last. Um, so at this point, I would love to hear your, your questions and reactions. Thank you, uh, John, for the nice um, presentation and also uh, enlightenment towards the how 
we should uh, or ideas how we should uh, make a new resilience building or resilience design any question from the floors yes there's already some questions yes please please um yes i have um you know i have lots of time today okay so said you can just, just ask value. directly we, uh, please we don't have meeting soon so just yeah thank you john Hey, uh, thank you, Bu Witi and Mr. John for uh, the opportunity. So I have a few questions that I want to ask to Mr. John. Okay. Uh, the first one is that I noticed how some vernacular houses in the Philippines uh, uses bamboo as a material. So uh, my question is, are there bamboo industries in Naga or Bichol region specifically? Because uh, after reading uh, a few profiles of Naga City, I haven't uh, found yet uh, regarding bamboo plantations or industries in Naga. So are the bamboo um, imported or taken from elsewhere in Philippines? And then <clears throat> the second one, the second question is uh, regarding the government structure in Philippines. Is there an administrative or leadership body that is lower than the barangay? Um, especially maybe in the neighborhood level. So uh, mm -hmm. in Indonesia, we have uh, something called RT and RW, which is kind of a leadership uh, body that governs the neighborhood. Uh, so is there um some kind of uh leadership uh official that governs uh the community in the neighborhood level uh thank you okay thank you very much okay first of all about the bamboo um that is a very interesting question and uh, to my knowledge and I, and I hope i'm wrong um <clears throat> there is probably no bamboo plantation but bamboo is abundant so that's why because it of its abundance that it can grow anywhere everywhere nobody bothered to farm it but obviously as we um, modernize and industrialize and get more developed that could become a scarce resource so whether that's a way of the future but it's that is just very interesting question because Maybe we think inside Philippines, oh, we have lots of bamboos, but when we get asked, have you ever exported them? Then we say, no, never. But if you talk of Thailand, Malaysia, or Indonesia, you, you guys are exporting bamboos as part of modern building materials. And why can't we? I do not know. So maybe that's failure, you know, failure to, to, to think of the right way. Second, um, government structure. Um, so our government, um, I'm trying to think. I think it's very much similar to Indonesia. So um, we have a pres presidential uh, republic system. So we're in, we don't have prime minister, we have the president. So the president is the head of the executive power. In a parliamentary system, the executive who implements the law and the legislative who drafts the law are one. In our system, it's separate. So the president and the agencies under the president, they just implement the operations. The legislative where is the one who drafts the law. Now that's at the national level. And the, in the local level, um, how it's structured is um, we have a, a governor which governs the province in Naga, you have Camarines Sur. Then underneath the, and, and sorry, in the executive branch, okay, the executive branch, you have the governor, which governs the Camarines Sur. You have the mayor, which governs the, the, um, the city of Naga. And then under him, you would have the, you would have either the councilor, no, no, sorry. You would have the barangay uh, chairman. Uh, barangay is our form of community. And depending on, on, on the sizes, I, I think that is the smallest that we have. 
because the idea of barangay it's something very vernacular it's it's barangay actually comes from the word balanghay which is a wooden uh, sorry which is a a boat that uh, inhabitants from Borneo use. And it's revolving around the context wherein everybody in a barangay should know each other, could have family relationship in that. So the answer is no. Uh, but in terms of, of operational at the barangay level, the barangay chairmen are usually like elders. But uh, below that, you have the Sangguni Ang Kabataan, which is S just uh, search SK. SK Barangay. So SK, these are the local um, youths. So they are supposed to complement the adults from a grass-based ideas and solution coming from the youths. So that's the SK. So these are all the executive. Then the legislative, you have councillors, congressmen, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, Sayed? The, um, do you still have any questions? Uh, yes. Um, so um, I've read on the internet that um, barangays could be um, uh, formed by something called Purok or CTO. Yes. Uh, can you explain about okay. uh, Purok, Purok and CTO? CTO? Is that an official? Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Um, Purok and CTO. Um, these are not really political uh, body, but that is more for a locational basis. You know, we don't have a, a Purok lead, uh, a CTO leader. Maybe previously before there was a Purok leader, but that is not elected. Maybe that is just a, a local elder. But a, a Purok or a CTO is more of saying, um, which part of barangay do you live? It's more of a locational um, um, naming uh, convention. You know, you say that I live in this barangay in Sitio, this one. But we, you don't say that, oh, I must first go to a Sitio level for, for policy before it can be implemented in barangay. No, I think... Um, that could happen in some barangays, but that's not that's not a universal um, system. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you for your explanation. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. Any more questions? Pak Bas, do you have questions? Oscar, yes, please uh, just turn on your uh, microphone and then you can just directly ask John. Um, okay, thanks, uh, Mr. John. Uh, I was wondering if there's any kind of cultural alarm system in Philippines, maybe especially in Naga City when uh, the disaster is about to struck the city, maybe yes. a custom, custom things like that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, in the previous lecture, we discussed about the NDRRRMC, <laughs> uh, the National uh, Disaster Risk Reduction Management um, Coordinating Council. So they would be the one to set the alarm. Um, as to the alarm standard, what we used to have is a storm category standard. Like, uh, like signal one, signal two, signal three, signal four. And at different signal, they would mean whether life would go on or whether businesses and schools would close down to even force evacuation. Now, even now about the level of, of uh, evacuation, there's no categories on that. So basically, uh, government would just say um, there is a. Um, I, I hope I'm wrong. I, I think that there is already a, a system for that. But whether the government would say that, you know, precaution or 
or option to relocate, or another level would be forced relocation. I think that that is one of the newer things that the current government is implementing. Uh, I think there is one on that maybe now. Uh, yeah, so I think that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, Oscar, is there any more questions? Uh, no, thanks. Thanks, Reza. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, from others, perhaps? Uh, can I ask some questions? Yeah, please do. Okay, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Sorry, if you could also, also just, uh, you know, oh, turn on your camera so if I can see you, you know, it would be <laughs> uh, a ah, more yeah. so, uh, casual discussion because I don't want this to be like very stiff. Okay. <laughs> Okay. okay, hello, Rafida. Yeah, uh, hello. So, I would like to ask some questions. First of all, whether the smart building system you mentioned before, like the concrete sensor, whether it's already commonly used in Philippines, because no. even buildings in Philippines mostly made of bamboo. But so, no, I, I don't think that is, um, you know, uh, the last part, you know, the, about the um, resilience and insights. I don't think many of them are are imposed in the Fili are being used in the Philippines. Um, basically, I just gathered ideas from some of the projects that I have seen, you know, from Singapore, the UK, and maybe offer it, you know, as a, as an idea to students that when you incorporate them in your solution, that gives you an edge over over other students from other schools. Hmm. Yeah. But do you think that would be applicable there? Oh, okay. The you know, about the formworks, yeah, about the yeah. that solution. Um, hmm. To be honest, the question is: um, Is our manpower resource lacking? I would say no. Is our um, weather climate very adverse? I would say no. Security, maybe yes in some area, but not, not to the point of even. So per, uh, unfortunately, maybe the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll tell you, um, in, in honesty, that system was used in, in, in an airbase, in an airbase project in the Middle East. I think it was in Afghanistan. So maybe it made sense there. Now, they're trying, they're using that in the UK because uh, especially in winter, you tend to be indoors. You, you minimize your time outside the building. Mm -hmm. But in, in the tropics, you know, we get to enjoy outdoor all, all days. Yeah. But maybe if you can have those system, and then you could argue to say that, hey, this building system has been implemented in this material, in this building, in this country. What if you put it in another material Maybe if you put it in in your facade, that could monitor the, the wind condition or the heat condition. Then you could adjust how the building reacts, you know, during calamity. You know what I mean? So that that could trigger different sensors, and maybe that could trigger where the floodings are happening or where there is that strong wind. Yeah. And that, okay, that thank could, you, sir, for um, no problem. That could still be part of the um, building management system. That um, if you have sensors on your roof system, and usually during storm, um, strong storm, some of the roofing sheets gets blown off, then you don't wait for the storm to pass with for the managers to get informed that a piece has been blown off already. So things like that. Okay. Okay, any more questions you still want to ask John about Thank Philippines? Thank you sir, for explanation. No problem. <laughs> Is there a question or maybe? Is, is Aji there? 
I do think so. Sorry, there is a yes, yes. quite no a loud sound. Hey man, do you have any question or reaction? Uh, very good, man. <laughs> <laughs> As always. So, uh, well, it's it, it's interesting that uh, actually our our vernacular buildings is uh, about the same with Indonesia, and also we share cultural. Uh, 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 traits also, but uh, since we have a different, uh, what do you call it, colonialism, so we are colonial masters. Colonial, yeah, colonial masters. So we have a Dutch and Portuguese and also Japan, Japan, and but you have uh, Americans. So we uh, we have a different approach on uh, uh, contemporary, more contemporary buildings. Well, it's a very good insight. I mean. Yeah, I hope the students get uh, more information and then ideas from your uh, lecture. And then I, I, I hope that we can win some of the prize. Yes, about uh, about that competition, what what still strikes me is um, I still do not grasp what are they what would they be asking from you? Are they asking you to design a building to yeah. offer master plan to offer uh, an urban design for a town center or hmm. for climate strategies i don't i don't know uh they they have to design uh, an area then they offer four four spots that is from the city towards the upper part there is uh, another tree above uh, the above the main city and then they ask uh, the students to give an idea how to design one area and then and it can be connected or implemented in other tree so it's a kind of uh, alternatives or um, not pilot, but the kind of uh, model that can be implemented later on. So, so um, currently there is there is not a defined area yet, mm -hmm. and they will select an area outside of the city as a uh, as a pilot testing for a new way of development. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, you you also can do the pilot inside the city. Because oh, okay. there are, uh, so the, the yeah, so we do have uh, like four, they, they offer us four, four places, four yeah. locations, I mean. And then mm. we should uh, see it and should, uh, should a kind of selection, but the, uh, how we see it from our own perspectives, how we can make a resilient area, something like that. Okay, okay. Uh, just, and, just more. and also we, we could see it from the perspective of architecture or also from uh, urban side, we mm -hmm. can, or building technology. Okay. Um, what um, I could uh, probably give a steer on is um, Naga City. We've, we've we've seen that they very much celebrate the river, and yet mm -hmm. their embankment is nothing to speak about. You know, if you're a yeah. visitor wanting to see that fluvial parade, mm -hmm. there's not even a a, a safe uh viewing stand so from an urban design perspective you are confronted with um flooding challenges which mm -hmm. centers around the city you are confronted with activation of the river without turning it into a dump and uh, a sustainable solution on that river and uh, basically a place for new growth and just by building that promenade that would have a significant economic gains on the okay. businesses around it. So I think that's a very potent area. I don't know whether it's, it's one of the options, yes or no. That second is um, 
we we've seen their downtowns and it's probably how typical downtowns in many cities in the Philippines are and basically there is no it's not a very safe and ideal streetscape experience with regards to traffic with regards to businesses it's quite chaotic at the very least and as Filipinos myself myself that is some of the feedbacks that I've heard to some of the foreigners I've spoken to when they visited the Philippines they use the word chaotic so mm -hmm. you know that is a that's a problem that is a challenge from an urban design point we're in how can you do how can you provide some sense of order in a downtown area mm -hmm to allow the people there to experience that an area in a safe and enjoyable manner without, but still making it feasible with matters of economy. And there are so many examples in Singapore that you could learn from, uh, you know, other Chinatowns, Little India, things like that. So uh, many things from that still to be had, yeah. John, uh, can I ask if uh, people, especially in the rural side, still appreciate vernacular buildings? I mean, do they want to still still want to stay in the traditional vernacular buildings, or they want to have a modern building? Okay, uh, that is a very good um, question, and. Um, let me just uh, bring this um, image now. Um, oh, sorry, my, my screen is still sharing. Okay, good. I'll just show you how downtown Naga looks like. And this is probably what you would understand why I call it quite chaotic. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's say this one. Yeah, so this is the, the city center. So you would have, and this is the remnants of the laws of the Indus law. You have the church, you have a town plaza, then you have the buildings around it. And if you look at the buildings, it's the design are pretty much the same, whether you're from Naga or from anywhere, any part of the, especially this kind of building, see? So uh, it, it, they're all just maximizing um, this, this uh, ground level, and yet the secondary level is not activated. The parking, uh, parking area is everywhere, so that is the challenge with regards to traditional housing. In the slides that I, I've shown, um, I'll just go to this. Okay. It's interesting to know that this one, um, I've known quite a number of families, even on the middle class or even rich class, that they would usually have a, a modern house. And when they have a big backyard or a rest house, they would have these cottages. And that is where they would sleep on during summer months. Um, so in terms of economic class, even though you're rich, you have a very modern house. Sometimes you want to feel, you, you're, you long for this kind of view. You know, mm -hmm. For you, that's like a, a relaxation. And in some of the fancy resorts now, they are emulating this design. So the, the, the challenge is, how can you offer a design that can give you this sense of experience and yet plugging it in this kind of landscape, you know? So, so that is, that, that, that's, that's, that's the challenge. Um, whether that could work or not, and again, looking at this uh, streetscape, you, you can't see the identity of Naga, you know? People will say, 
is this Naga? Is this Legaspi? Is this Manila? No one could mm -hmm. say. Yeah. But how the city, uh, how the citizen, I mean Filipino, respect uh, or proud of their country? For example, uh, here we like to have, if I am Japanese, then I want to have a kind of ornament that shows that I am a Japanese or do you, do you, do they, is very nationalistic or just don't care? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll just show you this. Um, the, okay, I'll, I'll show you this. Hmm. Now, okay, this one. This, this just came into my mind. This is a master developer, a community developer, and they're developing community housing, different types. And look at the naming of the community. Yeah, we do have you Bali have Tokyo, here. You have you have Bali, you have Phuket, you have Sentosa, you have mm -hmm. Paris, you have Miami, you have Stanford. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nowhere there you would find a Filipino term. Okay. And to me as a Filipino, that is so painful. That is so painful. When you're this, okay, and, and it's very interesting, you know, like if you buy, let's say, a, a land here in Miami, and in there you're supposed to design minimalist design. Can a minimalist architecture not be Filipino architecture? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does it have to be like a, a Miami architecture? And, and they have this Bali, you know? And they have this Phuket. So again, it, as a Filipino, I feel so embarrassed to, to show to showcase this to you. I and, and whether you as Indonesian, and whether you as Indonesian, do you feel proud or do you feel also the same? But if you can see Bali is one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, like we can say, okay, you have Bali, well, we have Boracay, but but why can't we have name that, that area Boracay? It's just so painful. So <laughs> I yeah. don't think I, I have an ex, a further explanation to that, but that is just the most painful thing. Mm -hmm. you know? So it, it okay. just tells us that um, we always aspire to copy our neighboring countries, mm -hmm. put their elements into us. We always celebrate them that we, we've lost who we are. So when we are talking about this vernacular, I think the most modern I could think of is this airport already mm -hmm. that oh at least it has that connection with our vernacular I remember when when I went to to Jakarta I think we were at terminal I can't remember Aji whether it's terminal one or terminal two but I, I, I maybe terminal two yeah going to Singapore yeah but you but you were telling us that it was um it was a good airport design, like it won accolades by being a, a garden airport. And at that time, in 2009, 2008, I can't remember, I was thinking to myself, well, at, at my airport, my, my image of an airport to me would be silver, you know, color silver, aluminum cladding. To me, that's modern, you know. That's following, you know, if I can see big glass, just like maybe airports in Hong Kong, that would be a successful airport. But maybe what Aji was telling me is that this is Indonesia. You go to Indonesia, you experience Indonesia, you don't experience Hong Kong. But the, so, but, the, uh, uh, but the new airport, it's yes? uglier. <laughs> the big one, the, the Terminal 3, I think. It's, uh, it's like, a, well, it's... it's Super ugly anyway. So so it's the first one, the terminal one and two is I think is very good. But the new one is just like what you're thinking. It's just so embarrassing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so so maybe you see there's that mindset mindset shift. You know, maybe when terminals one and two were built, uh, Indonesia was, was very much protective of your identity, that you are saying that we can still we will modernize and yet we will not lose hold of who we are. We will modernize in this way. We will not just copy an airport that is built in Singapore or Hong Kong or Tokyo. 
Um, so for us, I'm not saying our airports are good. This is the only airport that's been recently built in this manner. We also have um, many ugly airports, but maybe that is the new way forward. You know, like like you could still go for modernity, but hey, maybe try to find your vernacular roots and and um, how can uh, a building like this inspire you to build a building like this? Yeah, you, you don't really need to copy what is in the foreign to be effective. Yeah, you, you, this is a modern structure and yet it's influenced by this experience. You see that proof experience. So those are the challenges with regards to um, expressions of architecture. And let's not lose hold why they were built that way. When you look at the drawings, you know, it's, it's all about that passive air, passive wind to permeate through our buildings. And I remember Terminal 2 is like that. The departure lounges are like are like huts surrounded by, by plants all around. It's just like a, 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 a cabana or, or gazebo. So I think that's that would be a good way to move forward. But if you can offer something like this, you know, because you say that I'm Indonesian, so I have this feeling in my heart would, would make tick. But yet it's infused with all the latest technologies it's resilient against all the climate, then I don't see why that is not a winning proposition. Okay. Uh, and here we we do have a question from Pak Baskoro. Are there any regulation about mitigation in Naga City? Um, with regards to regulation, um, we all follow um, these laws. Mm -hmm. We all follow these laws, and um, mitigation regulation. No, because how should I say this? Um, there's always a, a disconnect between the rules and regulation versus what is built on the ground. Um, to many architects in the Philippines, people look at the laws as just a cumbersome, you know, like, why do we even need them? If I can just fi follow a design from Singapore, how can you tell me that it will not work? And that is, that is our, that, that, as, that is still the prevailing mindset. So it's not like maybe Singapore, or even UK, at least from what I've seen, we're in, if something happens on the ground, they will change the law so that that law will, will affect or will, will um, influence the way newer buildings are designed. So in, in the Philippines, no, because let's say in, in the 10 years that I've been in Singapore, if, you, if I was doing that project, uh, studio project with Aji on, on Sentosa, at that time, we were asked to think of Sentosa, of, sorry, in, in Orchard Road, we were, asked to rethink on, on how to reju rejuvenate Orchard Road. And yet, a few years after that, they influenced, uh, sorry, they rolled out a lot of urban design guidelines that gave economic uh, benefits for business owners to adopt new ways of what the government envisioned. And that is a clear manifestation on how the law impacts how people build. In the Philippines, when we build Greenbelt Mall, the one with terraces, it's not a result of a law that says that you have to build something like this. No, it's just it's just an architect thinking what could work or what they could copy from other countries. So uh, I think that's just my outlook on, on the building laws. And many of the building laws in the Philippines uh, were crafted, were designed uh, from an American parent law, like our building code mimics that from America or even our planning system. And even with regards to planning, we, we, we used to have a national land use um, agency, but that has become localized. So um, each city, they would have a city planning office that, that mandates the intended land use, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, but that's it. But with regards to urban design guidelines, 
very, very few places in the Philippines would have that. And if ever they would have that, they would usually be led by a private entity. Only in probably those in um, either Central Business District or in um, heritage towns like Vigan. So uh, any more question? Yes, I'm sorry. Is there any more questions? I want to ask a question, Mr. John. Okay. Yeah. I'm this? from group three. My name is Sultan. Okay. Yeah. So when you tell us about the characteristic of the historical building, uh, you, you tell us about the colonial age in Philippines, and you show us the building, which has a unique characteristic. It is consta consists of two messing. Uh, the lower zone was made from stone, and the upper zone is made from, mostly from wood, right? And yes. The upper zone is extended outside. Uh, yes. Yeah. And you say that when the earthquake happen, it will move independently. Yes, Actually, exactly. yeah. I want to ask the question, how can it move independently? Do the columns and beams are have the separated uh, material too, or how can it move? Okay. Can you, can you, okay. uh, yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah. So these two photos are not in the same house, but the logic is the same. So if I look at this uh, photo, so it's stone. And this is wood, yeah? Now, what I'm saying is that this floor, the structure of this wall, this floor does not rest on these walls. So basically, you could demolish these walls and this floor would remain standing, even though it's cantilevered. And it's evident in this photo. You see, this is the post. This is the wooden post that supports this, this floor. So this post runs from the ground and then there are joists or soleras in this floor. It goes up and then it supports the roof trusses. But this post and uh, this is not, it's not um, connected. If I will try to sketch in PowerPoint, it's just like, so imagine this is the floor and then, uh, and then this is the pose. Then this is the wall. That's the thick wall. So they are independent of each other. This is the uh, facade wall of the first floor. And it, it's like that. So that's the section. So they are quite independent. So even if this crumble, this structure would remain. And they are made from wood more lightweight than the stone. So the stone itself, it's not become some structural element, right? It's it's like a facet only? Uh, uh, yes. Oh. Yes, correct. It's, a, it's, it, it's uh, more evident in this building. Yeah, it, this is more, it's just a facade only. I've done a, uh, a restoration project, not by myself, but helping another architect in a restoration project in one, one of houses like this. And they had to remove the, the walls one by one and put them back together in order to do a proper restoration work. But the whole first floor remained intact, remained operational. Yeah, so yeah, so that's that, that is just the uh, technology behind it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. John, for the okay. answer. Actually, my, my group also have another question, maybe. Uh, yes, yes, please. Mr. Ripley, can you open me to or Yoke? Sorry? My friend will 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 tell the okay. question. Can you turn on your camera? Okay. Like whoever is asking the question. Yeah. 
this uh, if you ask the questions turn on your oh, sorry. camera yeah sorry okay mm -hmm. yeah. yoko will you ask your question directly where is yoko 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 turn on your camera is it Vascoro Tejo? <laughs> no, Vascoro Tejo is my colleague. Oh, sorry, 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 because I, I saw. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I just want to see who I'm talking to. <laughs> sorry. Okay, anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, so what's the question? Yoko, yeah, please turn on your microphone and then ask directly. I'm sorry, I cannot open my camera right now. Okay, it's okay. Uh, you you can with you know. Okay, uh, if 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 you know if you can't, then it's alright. I'm sorry. Thank you for your very insightful no presentation, Mr. Marvin. Uh, first, besides the positivity and optimism of the Filipinos, sorry, there sorry, any... sorry, sir, I, I I didn't hear that clearly. What's that? Besides the positivity and the optimism of the Filipinos. Okay. Is there any special behavior of Filipinos or Nagasiti citizens that differentiates Filipinos from other countries? The second one is, are there so any... Aside from the uh, positivity of the Filipinos, is there special traits that differentiates Filipinos from other countries? Is that the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What's the second question? Are there any specific city char characteristics in Nago City or the Philippines? Uh, for example, in Indonesia, a city square or alun-alun are usually recognized as one of the identities of the cities in Java. So are there any special features in, Philippine, in, in the cities of Philippines? Thank you. So, so what is in Indonesia? What type? What, what example did you give? Sorry. Alun alun. Alun alun. Alun alun. alun, alun. Is it like wave? It's like a is city that? square. It's a city square. Oh, okay, okay. City square. Okay. So uh, in Philippines, uh, what we have is uh, So I think for us, what we have is the loss of the Indies during the Spanish time, uh, or I think I've mentioned before the uh, Leyes de las Indias, or this is in Intramuros in Manila. And what, what that means is that um, if you go to the top view, um, The loss of the Indies, what it always shows is that you have the church, what's the church here? Uh, a, a plaza, and then you have, sorry, so, so this is the church, you have the plaza, and then the principalia. So it's always that one that you would see. Let's say if you, for example, if you go to another city, let's say vegan city, mm -hmm. A more defined one. So there is always that you have the church, you have the plaza, mm -hmm. then you have the seminary, then you have the city hall, another plaza, then this is the houses of the principalia. So let's say if you go to, um, I'm trying to think of, um, let's say you go to uh, Bacolod City. So Bacolod City, they would always have that um, plaza in the middle. 
and then surrounded by schools, by halls of justice. So that is um, more of the uh, Spanish uh, planning. And then, uh, so that is evident in, in every towns in, in the Philippines. Um, if not Spanish, then you would have the American. So for American, then you could just say, let's say, uh, uh, Baguio City. So, so for Baguio City, it's more, I mean, for American planning, it's more grand. You know, this is the city hall. It's, you have a, a feeling like a, a, like a, a central mall. So you have a lake, you have public grounds, and then with the commercial centers around it, or even in let's say Cebu City. So Cebu City, um, so in the case of Cebu, this area is the Spanish, um, Spanish area, Spanish colonial area and how it's more regular regular street grid with um, city square. Uh, when the Americans came, they pulled the city hall to a more prominent site. And then it has that grand boulevard with a rotunda. So uh, that is more on city planning. Uh, what else I could think of, let's say Silai City. So Silai City is another, um, heritage city of which I've done some conservation uh, projects with as a, as a student. Uh, there is that town plaza, that church, that uh, city hall. So there's always that, that concept and it's a rectilinear planning. Uh, so that's, that's I, I think that's the, is that the answer that, that you are looking for? Mm-hmm. Yoko, is, do you still you have so more questions? Oh, no. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so look at this, look at this uh, planning. This is a, a small town and the planning is uh, you have the church, you have the seat, the square, and then you have the houses of the, uh, the principality or the rich class around it. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's all rectilinear from it. Mm -hmm. So that is a typical uh, planning. And about the government, about the government building, official buildings, uh, what, uh, what style normally they follow? Oh, okay. Um, you, you can guess. <laughs> Spanish, no? No. <laughs> it's oh. this style. It's this style. So for us, it's um, usually, uh, so I'm going to show you example. Okay, I'll tell you why. Um, uh, actually, uh, Aduana Manila. Yeah, so this is a Spanish relic building, okay? So Aduana is like a city hall. So when you say aduana, uh, aduana Mexico, let's say, oh no, it's not showing. So when you say aduana as a Spanish term, it's just really like a, a, a city hall building. And this is the Spanish uh, era structure. And this is how it looks like. Mm -hmm. if, you look, if you can uh, try to decipher the design. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Americans came, and these are the types of buildings they built. So let's say Manila City Hall. So it has that, that uh, pediment. You can, um, um, sorry, Negros. And you see this neoclassical building? 
So that is in the province so of, of Negros. Mm -hmm. So if you, let's say um, Ilocos Sur Capital. So again, that column. I, I don't know whether you can see my screen, you can see the images. Yeah, we can see. Okay, Cebu yeah. Capital. So very American, very uh, neoclassical. Mm -hmm. So uh, what else? Um, National Museum Philippines. So it, it, it would always has that colonnade. So uh, Bulacan capital. Yeah, so it's it's pretty much that 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 view. I, let's let's take a look whether that's the same for Bicol. Yeah. So so this is in Sorsogon. So it would still have that. But let's say if you look at Zamboanga City Hall. Uh, so Zamboanga City Hall has that Spanish uh, look. But let's say capital. Yeah, so some newer interpretation is, is just ugly, <laughs> to be honest. So it doesn't. So those are just a typical look. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we okay. still have two more questions. Okay. One is from Ropi. Ropi, are you there? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hello, Mr. Jun. So uh, I would like to ask about the security, uh, about the security in residential housing. So if we see in Indonesia, our, our, in our country, uh, most of the house is uh, French and sometimes the windows are drilled. So how about there? How they are, how Filipino, uh, uh, how Filipino uh, prevent from, from the thief or crime or how they are communicate with the community to prevent that? Prevent that. Oh. Okay. Um, typically in Philippines, we would have, um, as like some, same as what you mentioned, we would have gates, window grills. Uh, yeah. So typically, that that is how they they would be. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. I think that's the same as in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And this is sorry. A, so the last question. The last question, Ark. This. Can you hear my voice? <laughs> yes. Yes. Arkansia, Aras. Yeah. You can uh, call me Ark. Or okay. Sure. Ark. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. John, I want to ask you. Um, Maybe this is the most random question in entire okay. um, discussion. Uh, what is the most favorite uh, local food in Philippines? And maybe especially you can uh, tell me the yes, most favorite yes, local food yes, in yes, Naga City. Sorry, uh, yeah. Sorry, okay. sorry. What's the most uh, favorite food? Yeah in Naga City especially and is there any um, maybe colonial influence food in Philippines because in Indonesia we have a lot of um, influence food and uh, this may be a little bit sensitive but I really want to know about uh, the Filipino is the Filipino is a picky person when they are uh, trying to eat uh, daily food and that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. So for Philippines, so let's say if I just click Filipino food, Filipino food, let's see what, what you would see. Okay. Now, um, 
some of which may, maybe looks like Indonesia, like, like this one. Uh, now, now um, some would have some Oriental in them, Oriental um, traces. Now, if I put Filipino adobo, that one would have Spanish influence in it. In terms of typical fare, um, it's always with rice. So I think um, all the peoples in Southeast Asian region and the ASEAN community, we all have rice as our staple. So that's the same. And it's just a matter of what do you pay, what do you pair with your rice, whether it's adobo or machado. It's they, they would vary. So again, this one would have like a, that Spanish uh, feel in that. Uh, but our food is more um, maybe salty, but not so much spicy. In the Philippines, it's also the Bicol food. It's only this one, because Bicol, where, where Naga is, is known for spicy food. So you would have, uh, uh, what's called this, uh, Bicol Express. And oh, yeah, also this one. Uh, uh, th these are the types of food that we usually have. Um, this is called uh, Laing. Which is made up for made from laing uh, plant leaf with with obviously with with uh, chili or spike or chili. Yeah, so that's our and then for for uh, other influence, you know, uh, our um, I don't know whether you, you know Jollibee, whether there is Jollibee in Indonesia, but Jollibee is our main export, so that is very American. You look at the fried chicken and mm -hmm. spaghetti and hamburger. That's very American influence. So, so that has cemented the American culture in, in us. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you. I hope uh, you uh, it doesn't this the last question doesn't make you uh, want to go back home because we are talking about food. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Is there a Jollibee in Indonesia? I don't know. No, I don't no. think so. Okay. Kita nggak punya ya? We don't, yeah, we don't think no, so. No, but no, I, yeah, I know have. this kind of okay. brand. I think there's one in, uh, there, there's some in, in Brunei Singapore. and Singapore. And yeah, Singapore, Singapore yeah. Brunei, yeah. there's a lot of I Jollibee. think so. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay. then. This will be the our last question. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Very, John. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much, John, for mm -hmm. your uh, presentation as well, answering all the questions, uh, mm -hmm. and also give our uh, our my students insights uh, regarding our uh, competition in Naga City. I hope you could come to see our last presentation in May. May 25, yeah. yes. Yeah. And uh, before we close our event, our session here, let's take one last group picture. I will send you a, a certificate via email, John. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, everyone, as your cam on, I can't see everyone's just yet. So we're gonna wait for a few more to join in. Diana, Deandra, and Will then Angeline still can't see you. All right, we're gonna take the first page. One, two, smile. Last page, one, two, smile. Thank you, that's it, we did. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, see you next time, John. Have a okay. nice weekend. Okay, thank I you very I much. Uh, it's yes. been a pleasure sharing with you and I hope you know you have found my, my sharing useful. 
Oh, yes, very. And I, and I would love to see your, your designs, you know, what they, they would be like. And see? And I would like I would love to see your designs, you know, your proposals and how they would be like. And you know, even during that time or in leading to that, if you have some questions, you know, just just I mean you could course them through Widi. You know, I, I'd be happy to answer uh what whatever I can really. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, John. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Th yeah, thanks. Have a nice weekend. Well, All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, sir. Bye-bye.